Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Gulchin, for the invitation. It's great to be back uh, after having assisted almost every year, I think. Uh, great to see the Property and Freedom Society back in its place. Uh, the title of my talk may seem like a truism to you, schooling and state making, and uh, I guess almost every one of you would assume that in particular public schools are an instrument to coerce and indoctrinate our children into statism. Uh, if you are now slumbering off because you assume that I'll tell you only what you already know, then of course you don't know me well. Uh, I have some surprises for you, but don't be too afraid. Uh, after this little purgatory, uh, thanks uh, Karl Peter, of some complications and surprises, I think a stark truth will re-emerge ever more clearly at the end. Uh, I'll base my observations on the history, mainly the history of the German-speaking countries. Uh, it's the history I know best, and luckily for me, it's uh, the segment of history which is most important for the universal history of schooling and state-making. And the reason for that is that, in particular, Prussia, but also absolutist Austria, uh, and even uh, some reform pedagogues in Switzerland had an outstanding influence uh, on uh, the international development, uh, even so far as uh, in the US schooling was copied from the Prussians and uh, 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 US representatives traveled Prussia, the same in France uh, and almost everywhere. This institution of public mass schooling uh, really ha had gotten a lot of influence from the German uh, histories. So let's start uh, with the most obvious uh, thing, and there I can pick up right after the marvelous talk from Al Alessandro before noon, uh, the closest and most obvious link between schooling and state making is war making. And that's of course why the example of Prussia may seem so important. Even there was the saying at the time that the military uh, advances and uh, successes of the Prussians are due to their schooling. Uh, systems. It's uh, not as obvious as it seems, uh, but let me start there at the most obvious link. Uh, I think uh, the closest correlation is with a change in how modern governments looked at their subjects. They realized that human beings are a resource for the state. First, of course, as manpower, as cannon fodder for war making, but then and that also uh, pushed by advances in military technology due to wars getting more and more expensive, so the economic basis uh, of war making uh, necessitated development of human capital as well and the human population. Uh, and uh, that insight seemed to be most obvious for the Prussians, uh, more enlightened rulers like Frederick II. Uh, so um, I think the link here is in conscription. It's you want to keep track of every citizen of your country. And that, of course, gives the sinister and I think real meaning to the line that you all know from the US potentially, leaving no child behind. Leaving no child behind means keeping track of every single child because he is a potential conscript and a taxpayer and you don't want to lose out on that human resource. Um, how do you use uh, education or schooling to this advantage? So it's on the one side, is, is you have the keeping track. On the other side, I think nationalism has to be considered a military technology as well. Uh, and it was a success story in military terms. And schooling was considered at the time as one of the major instruments for nation formation or nation building. So when people talked about Nationalbildung, that's in German, very ambivalent meaning, very complicated term, the Bildung, which is education, but you could also translate it as nation building, nation formation, raising a nation, uh, or cultivating a nation. Uh, and uh, I, I read from a very important text uh, from the time uh, to give you an idea of Fichte, the addresses to the German nation. Uh, 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 Fichte, German philosopher, wrote about schooling and the role or the relation between schooling and state-making as follows. The state which introduced universally the national education proposed by us, from the moment that a new generation of youths had passed through it, 
would need no special army at all, but would have in them an army such as no age as yet has seen. In the heart of each individual, there lives love of the community of which he is a member of the state and of his country, and this love destroys every other selfish impulse. The state can summon them and put them under arms when it will, and can be sure that no enemy will defeat them. Well, there it looks like a smoking gun, but there I have some surprise for you. Of course, Fichte was no government official and it was no government decree. And oddly enough, his addresses to the German nation were temporarily censored and prohibited by governments. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that, of course, in nationalism, there's not only state making, but there's a cultural process as well. And I think it's quite important to differentiate between the two. And most people get causalities backward in politics. Uh, and they think that uh, there's like the monolithical state and in the mechanical process, the old seeing state issues something and then it just works out and the state just coerces its way. Uh, on the opposite, there was of course uh, a phase of, of uh, national formation within the German people where the German language uh, became more important, more widely spoken and used and correspondent in correspondences as well. And uh, an obvious race in culture happening at the time, and that was before the state used that as a reason for centralization. Uh, so most people assume that it's the state first centralizing and using nationalism to its advantages, but uh, I think they are interlinked and, and uh, uh, correlated developments at the same time. And uh, I think there's uh, quite an analogy to what uh, Tim uh, was talking about. Unfortunately, I, I missed your talk, but I followed the very interesting panel discussion about Japan. Um, and of course, the Japans are considered the Prussians of Asia. Uh, and there you see at the same time this question of polite society is a kind of raising a cultural level within a society Society, and it leads to this ambivalence as well, and this ambivalence was addressed, I think, by Thomas by asking how can a population which in the individual is so cultivated and so polite be so atrocious uh, as an occupying force. And the same, of course, could be said of the Prussians, and it was Goethe famously who observed uh, that he feels great pain when he thinks about the German nation. So acht beim Einzelnen, so miserable im Ganzen. I think it's a great line. It still applies to the Germans today. Uh, they are so respectable in the individual and so deplorable as a collective. Uh, and uh, of course, there are quite a few misunderstandings here in Fichte as well. He thinks that society and the state are more or less the same. But you could read Fichte and other idealist philosophers of the time of national awakening as people thinking about raising the cultural level of the population. And thus you could read it in a sense of a spirit of self-government, of responsible people who form a militia. That's one possible interpretation of people more equal before the law, not being, not necessitating an absolutist ruler because in themselves they have the moral law and they apply it and together they're capable of being a grand nation. And I think that's one of the reasons why, of course, the story isn't as easy as it seems, that it wasn't just nationalism imposed from above, but it was an uneasy relationship. And the same uneasy relationship uh, we see uh, with schooling. Uh, but still, uh, Fichte realizes something as a progressive and enlightened mind, uh, that uh, coercion and the state apparatus does not depend so much on physical coercion and force, but a lot of it is mental games or mind games. Uh, and uh, I think that's a crucial insight from praxeology, uh, which I would apply to questions of coercion as well. I, I was supposed to talk about the praxeology of coercion, so I'll give you a little summary, a teaser of what you may have missed. Uh, we're talking about that. Uh, I think when we consider coercion, of course, we can't just apply the mechanical cause-effect uh, uh, relations and think that they are all important. Uh, most important are mental states, anticipation, and the cause-effect relations in our minds and, and uh, the actions uh, of other people. So the state, of course, depends mostly on coercion not being necessary because it's based on fear, so threats, 
not all, all of those threads are backed, and it's compliance. Uh, it's, uh, of course, changing the mindset of the population. Uh, and that has been understood, and I think it was one of the uh, outcomings of enlightenment, of people with a critical state of mind thinking about government, not all good people, unfortunately, and uh, uh, I think a lot of the evil in government, of course, was stirred on by enlightened thinkers, uh, um, by realizing some very dark truths about uh, mastering government, uh, and it's of course the Machiavellian tradition, uh, but that uh, lived on in a bit different spirit, uh, more unconsciously in, in, in the French and German traditions as well. Uh, and I think one line uh, uh, I, I have to cite to you, uh, which uh, puts it uh, to the point most clearly, and that's by uh, Francois Guizot. Uh, Guizot was the French Minister of Education. He was an enlightened liberal spirit, uh, considered as such, but he was the main force in uh, instituting uh, government mass schooling in France, of course, following the example of Prussia. So he sent his friend and employee, Victor Guizot, to Prussia to travel there and figure out how they are doing it. Uh, and uh, he wrote to him uh, uh, the reason why, why that's important, why he has to go there. And the line says, the greatest problem of modern societies is the governance of minds. It's the governance of minds. Uh, and I think that's a crucial insight here. Uh, and that's why, of course, there was a lot of back and forth about schooling, uh, but it was an uneasy uh, relation. The first uh, insight about why schooling would be necessary or what a function schooling could have because of course there was schooling before uh, the state took an active interest in schooling um, and the first insight by more progressively more enlightened governors like frederick the great was that schooling could be a device to increase the homogeneity of the population. And for Prussia, there was uh, particular importance due to the Polish uh, regions that uh, they occupied or were, became part of Prussia. Uh, so it was considered as an instrument to homogenize the population. But not only in, in the linguistic aspects and the cultural aspects, uh, more importantly, uh, Frederick the Great realized that he had to fill a gap that was left over by the receding importance of religion. Uh, and he really worried a lot about that vacuum potentially being left. He himself was an atheist, uh, uh, potentially homosexual uh, as well, a uh, very modern spirit, modern mind, but troubled by uh, the problems he saw on, on going from an old agrarian society to a more modernized, industrialized society. Uh, and uh, so sometimes, I mean, of course, you could cite Frederick the Great as being an enthusiastic about schooling, achieving that purpose. But I think if you read more from him, you realize that on average, he was much more skeptical about it. So uh, I think uh, mostly he doubted that schooling would achieve that. And he thought that schooling uh, actually could be dangerous and it could reduce the lack of homogeneity because, of course, it wasn't obvious what could replace religion as the controlling institutions. Of course, the state potentially, but the state was lacking the homogeneity that it wanted to impose. Uh, so it's a kind of vicious circle here. And it wasn't obvious to uh, Frederick uh, the Great and it wasn't obvious to governments uh, since then. So there was a very interesting back and forth with, um, over time, I think the more important forces in government tended to be reactive that means they wanted to avoid increasing schooling, wanted to roll it back in a way, uh, wanted to limit the subjects that, that, that are schooled uh, and control it, most importantly control what is schooled, but uh, not really expand it as such, and if it's expanded, keep it separate between the different classes of society, so not to endanger the kind of equilibrium uh, of society and uh, uh, certainly not ad advance progressive and revolutionary thought as potentially Fichte uh, was a member of that class, not that easily controllable, these enthusiastic nationalistic forces which are not that easy to control from uh, a government uh, point of view. Uh, of course, this uh, uneasy relation between schooling and religion and schooling as a means of homogeneity was of particular importance after the Reformation and uh, uh, there we see a lot of focusing on like leaving no child behind in the Protestant traditions, in particular the Calvinist traditions, because I think one of the uh, expectations of uh, uh, 
Protestants was that you could find a new homogeneity in the purity uh, of belief uh, and the purity, of course, in sola scriptura uh, and, and so on. And it was interestingly the Calvinists in the US as well who were a major force behind the homogenization of schooling and rolling out uh, state-controlled schooling. Um, and uh, with Luther already we, we have a line where he writes or he warns that missing out a single child, leaving behind one single child is morally equivalent to raping a virgin. It's a crazy thought, uh, uh, but it's like leaving a child to be spoiled by parents which are not as insightful as they should be, and you can really trust the parents. You need, of course, some state guarantee of the purity of that kind of schooling. Uh, and that thinking is still behind today's German uh, legislation in schooling. And, uh, Germany is one of the strictest countries in really keeping track of children, making sure that they are not tainted by their parents uh, uh, who may teach subjects not in accordance with uh, what the state decrees uh, uh, as, as well it uh, yeah, and so on. Uh, so of course there's a quite long history going back, but uh, it took a lot of time for the state to create an apparatus out of that and it wasn't as easy, not as straightforward and at times it seemed like the state was pu uh, pushing the brakes uh, as much as possible. Uh, and uh, that's of course modernity. That's modernity. You have a uh, lack of homogeneity, a lot of doubts. Uh, some people, for some people, it's not going fast enough, and other people react in a forceful way. You have all these reactions and, and uh, reactionary forces, uh, and uh, uh, there are like 180 degrees changes. Uh, even if you have a, a, a monarchic uh, government uh, uh, with the succession, you can have a total change in outlook, uh, and with uh, advisors, ministers, changes, you can have changes in outlook, and they changed in Prussia. So at times, Prussia was really progressive in education. What does that mean? They followed examples of the best teachers, and one of major influence was Pestalozzi, who was a Swiss uh, teacher, uh, and uh, I think uh, people like Pestalozzi and Humboldt, uh, of course, reflect some of the positive things of that uh, feeling of worrying about schooling, worrying because there it's really a worry about the development and the cultivation of the child. And I think there's something sincere behind that in, in, in really understanding that there's childhood because before that it wasn't seen as really a separation between adult life and childhood. So coming from parts of the nobility, but in particular of the, the burghers uh, in the cities uh, came this reflection of a, a phase of child development where you should protect the child and enable it to become a fully developed personality. Um, and so I think there's some good in that, but it's very interesting that Prussian state officials uh, uh, in charge of one of the most imposing coercive apparatuses of the time had no better idea how to create an apparatus of schooling than sending government employees to learn under Pestalozzi. So Pestalozzi had a private institute in Switzerland and the Prussian government begged him to take up some government officials and they would pay handsomely for them. And so he got, he took at most two or three people at the same time and he charged uh, the government and they would be allowed to learn under him for two to three years. And then of course they should start new seminaries for the formation of more uh, teachers. Because there we see, and that I find very interesting, and of course you can have all this grandiose thinking about the government and, and the state, and you forget that it's people, uh, and you need actual people to do the stuff, uh, and uh, so you have all these grandiose addresses to the nation, and decrees, uh, and plans, and they don't really work out. Because if you look at the teachers on the ground, you figure out, okay, most are <laughs> really not functional, because you have to figure out who are teachers, uh, I mean, how are they selected? How does someone happen to be a teacher? Uh, and there we need to look back what was the state of schooling before state schooling. Uh, so I tell you a little bit about that. Of course, there were schools, and most schools, as you can imagine, were church schools, but it's more of the, uh, the, 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 the local church organization. Uh, and I think it had a very practical uh, thing. It was just... Uh, uh, controlling or childcare, more or less. Uh, uh, so you needed one person to look after the children, to of course bring them up a little bit in the Christian culture, have them read the Bible, um, uh, and so on. But it was considered 
uh, a fairly low-ranking task. So the teachers in this church control education were usually on the social level the downmost people. They were working on the side of sacristan, so they were helping uh, the priest uh, with the menial stuff that, that you need uh, for service. And uh, of course, I think the reason for that is in an agrarian society, in the villages, uh, who's taking care of the kids? the person you don't need because he's not that useful elsewhere. I mean, because otherwise you need every hand, you need every working hand, you need every mind capable, uh, because it's just a lot of work in our climate uh, uh, to live on the basis of the land. There's a lot of occupation. So usually you only had school in winter, and then it was uh, a lowly uh, people with very low pay. So that's what you find when you start out uh, looking, trying to control teachers. Uh, uh, they found uh, that they are not the most literate, uh, <laughs> not the, the most advanced people, but they are just keeping or uh, doing a job, and the most important job seems to be childcare. And I think that has remained true until today. I think most parents still have grandiose ideas or thinking of school. I think mostly school has the function of taking care of your children while you're working uh, so they, they don't uh, disturb you. In particular, if you have a pandemic, then most parents realized, oh my God, schools are closed, I have to work at home, how terrible, I'm so grateful for the state to have a school running usually, and now I see how important schooling is, uh, uh, because really they, it's a fancy word for childcare. Um, apart from that rural tradition, of course, we had the uh, city uh, school, and there is very little literature, so it's, um, we don't see that, but that was really an extensive part of schooling. And uh, if you remember, I think maybe it's 10 years ago or something like that, I talked about the history of universities, and I talked about uh, the prehistory of state con before state-controlled universities, and there's a similar picture here. Uh, it's just demand by parents, and usually very practical demands, and they send their children to Winkelschulen, uh, corner schools. And uh, of course, the term corner schools implies that, oh, they are terribly uncontrolled institutions. Uh, you see a lot of correspondence between government officials that like, oh my God, everyone can open such a corner school. How terrible. I mean, everyone who sees fit and who finds customers is allowed to open such a corner school. That's terrible. Um, there are some numbers, I could find some numbers, and they showed that the number is surprisingly high. So there was quite an extensive network of schooling before state controlled and state imposed schools, uh, but uh, very little oversight. That's why there's very little literature, uh, because of course the state who has conscription, who is keeping track, well, everyone wasn't keeping track of those schools, and that was the main reason why, he wanted, why the state wanted to shut them down, of course, because he wasn't keeping track of what's happening there. So there's an extensive network of more practical oriented, more utilitarian, I'd say, schools in the cities. Uh, for the needs of merchants and, and uh, other employees uh, and so on. And then the third segment where really state uh, schooling has its main founding is the formation of the military and, and uh, military education. So the Prussians sometimes say the army is the school of the nation uh, and things like that. And they even had uh, uh, veterans, uh, wounded veterans teach in schools because it's really hard to come up with all the employees uh, for that mass schooling that you intended for, but you have to train the people, you have to figure out how to train them, uh, and uh, uh, you couldn't really find them because you have decided before that what was schooling before isn't really according to your needs, so you can't really take the people from the corner schools and you try to build up something new and replace uh, the church uh, uh, as uh, the main institution keeping track of that. Now, I'll give you something more surprising there, something maybe more surprising there is, I think, one good argument for state schooling, um, and uh, I'll try to refute it in a way, but still, I think it has to be taken seriously, and I think it was uh, the most convincing way to put it was done by someone who gave a lecture here many, many years ago, uh, Heiner Rindermann, who is a German psychologist, uh, and uh, he, uh, his hypothesis is that this kind of schooling, uh, in particular how it was then instituted by, by the state, but of course taking over from the church tradition, raised IQ points by three IQ points every year 
of this kind of formal schooling, uh, even if it is repetitive schooling, road learning as it is, uh, of course there's a correlation between memorizing and IQ, intellectual analytical capabilities. Um, and of course you can take that hypothesis a bit further. He even ventured and uh, even more strongly that point was made by Öster Dikhoff, uh, uh, who he cites a lot, uh, who looks into the human capital formation uh, that was needed for industrialization. And it's all about the question, what does it need for human beings to function in the modern, industrialized, highly cooperative society? So that hypothesis says that potentially schooling could be a preparation first by homogenizing people, using the same language and the same analytical skills, being more capable to cooperate, and secondly, by raising their intellectual level, analytical capacities, and so on. And again, I can't, I can't entirely refute it. Uh, this is really hard to tell. It's about alternative history. We don't know what was crowded out by the state schooling. We don't know the alternative history that could have developed. I have my doubts about this hypothesis, and I think I have some ideas uh, where that could be mistaken. Again, I assume that the causality is backward again. Uh, because then you see with literacy numbers, in particular in Great Britain, for example, which should be, I mean, the, the main, if really it goes from literacy schooling to industrialization, then Great Britain should be first. But actually, literacy rates were lower in Great Britain than, than in Prussia, uh, even though they are industrialized first. And they preceded schooling a lot. So schooling was, uh, or compulsory, compulsory schooling was instituted fairly late in Great Britain when already almost universal literacy was achieved. Uh, uh, so I think that the causality is backward, that you have a modern society with higher literacy. Of course, reformation was a process going hand in hand with higher literacy as well. So a lot of developments that started much earlier than effective compulsory government schooling. Because, of course, you have the ideas of uh, government schooling, but making it effective, like leaving no child behind, as it works out in Germany today, that takes uh, uh, decades or even a century because you need all that stuff, and then still it doesn't work out the way you assume it uh, to work out. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if schooling would be behind the, the, the Flynn effect, that's, that's the name for, for the raising of IQ numbers over time in Western nations uh, uh, that is observed, I think, uh, that uh, it's more likely that schooling acted as a eugenics uh, device, more or less, because for a time, school leaving exams were, were the necessary uh, requirement to marry, to get marriage uh, in Prussia in particular. So, uh, and of course, you have discrimination against unschooled people, which hinders uh, their uh, possibility to have flourishing careers and support families and so on. So I think there's some eugenic effect potentially there uh, and um, of course a selective effect uh, uh, as well. Uh, and the mo highest correlation between uh, schooling results in testing of which IQ is part of uh, is uh, socio-economic status. Uh, so of course it works as a filter for socio-economic status and it enhances the possibilities for people of that according socioeconomic status who go for schooling to support families uh, uh, because they have better paying careers uh, uh, and and so on. So I would suggest uh, uh, that as one potential explanation and uh, another one is that uh, we know from the twin studies that most IQ effects of schooling are receding. Uh, that means after schooling it doesn't take long and uh, the IQ level goes down there which is not correlated with other factors like socioeconomic status and heritability of course. Uh, uh, so I don't think it's such a long-lasting effect that could really accumulate over time. So I have my doubts but it's really hard to refute it and I think it's one of the best cases for this kind of mass cooling as it's happening. Uh, and I think most parents have that unconsciously or consciously that fear that if their children go, don't go, go to school, they'll miss out career-wise, income-wise, uh, and not be well enough prepared for careers in a modern society. And I think there are additional reasons uh, for that, uh, uh, because Mostly, uh, that kind of schooling is about status games. Uh, and uh, I think if you really look at the history of schooling, you see that uh, a lot of it is status games played really well. 
uh, to the benefit of a certain group, uh, and this group are the teachers, of course. Uh, so the history of schooling estate making is a history of the social rise of a class of people from the lowest level in society with lowest income to a fairly high status and bourgeois status in society. And not only, of course, this rise individually, but the number of people uh, in such employment has increased tremendously. Uh, so I think uh, one of the best ways to realistically analyze the history of schooling, as with other government institutions, is through the kind of class theory, which is not Marxist, but uh, Rothbard and Hans Hoppe in their writings have remembered us as a much longer and, and much more solid class theory, going back to the French, to Noyer and Comte, uh, and looking at those who are benefiting uh, by the schemes uh, of the state and state-mandated schooling and other things, of course, mandated by the state. So I think you can read a lot of that as using status games in a society which is uncertain because this homogeneity is lacking. Uh, so a lot of it is driven by private initiative uh, of parents uh, who are, in a way, abused in their status-seeking by a class of teachers, legitimizing schooling as, of course, always shifting with the zeitgeist, uh, with the spirit of the time. Uh, that's why we have, among the class of teachers, uh, at first, the most uh, or a very high proportion of reactionary voices, uh, counter-reformatory uh, voices, and then it shifts to enthusiastic nationalistic voices. And then, of course, it explains to us why the highest number of Nazi voters in any segment was among teachers. Uh, uh, so it's not uh, the downtrodden, it's really a class of people who expect to benefit the most by statement that it control and leaving not a single child behind because, of course, every single child, as every poor person, is another reason for more money for your salary, your institution, uh, and so on. Uh, so I think that explains most. So it's not monolithically the state imposing it, but it's a lot of hijacking the legitimacy of the state for the interest of particular groups uh, of people. Uh, so that's why I doubt that school really is an instrument of indoctrination. And uh, let me tell you uh, about that a little more. Um, now, most people assume that in public school, of course, you have the teachers who are nowadays mostly uh, a very large proportion are in Germany are voting for the Greens uh, and the Social Democrats, and they seem to be very zeitgeist status. But I say, okay, nothing new here. Uh, of course, they pick the most uh, well working brand of statism at the time to get more money <laughs> towards their class. Uh, so that alone suffices to, to explain the ideological tendencies. Uh, and uh, I think it's quite similar to what has happened in journalism, uh, that uh, journalists and teachers have lived off an increased prestige for their institutions and making us all believe in the importance of education and schooling. And, uh, if you think that you can use schooling for indoctrination, or think it's uh, you are or children are indoctrinated, I think you have a wrong idea of the premise of schooling. Uh, I think that's an illusion. I don't think that's how it works. Schooling doesn't work that way, that you have a package of knowledge coming from the teacher and it's passed on to the children and it's really statist knowledge that's passed on or that the state can control what kind of knowledge is passed on. That's why the real experience by the absolutists was they were very, very, because they were very skeptical because they realized, oh my God, it really doesn't work like that. We have to control every teacher uh, because if we have more teachers, of course, what happens? You have more and more teachers, the average quality of the teacher goes down and the average controllability of the teacher goes down and you have a new class with a new class interest which is not the same as the state's interest and the former uh, government. So you have a lot of potential revolutionary uh, um, uh, segment in, in society. So it's really hard to just pass on knowledge. That's not how schooling works. So I think schooling is overrated a lot uh, and uh, uh, by uh, parents as well. And that illusion of schooling as transporting the necessary knowledge has been abused. And I think it's a similar illusion to journalism as a control mechanism for democracy. It's like schooling as a kind of knowledge conveyor for a knowledge economy and a modern society that is abused 
by siphoning off this prestige and legitimization for the class of people employed uh, in schooling. And so it's not really direct indoctrination, I think it's indoctrinability, that's a term by Eibel Eibesfeld, an Austrian ethnologist, uh, who thinks that uh, a certain kind of indoctrinability is useful for large societies. Uh, he's a bit of a statist here, uh, and uh, uh, I think that unconsciously he was really behind it. And what uh, leads to this kind of indoctrinability? I think first, uh, if you get to believe children in uh, things that turn out to be nonsense, which is unavoidable if you have a large number of teachers. Uh, I can uh, remember many times in school, I, because I was reading extensively very early, and I would just say, okay, that's wrong, I'm, and, and the teacher would say, no, I, <laughs> it can't be wrong. But of course, I mean, obviously, teacher can't read ev everything. Uh, of course, usually you look at who's becoming a teacher, usually someone who doesn't qualify enough to have a full degree, so they have the two half degrees. Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to uh, put down teachers here, uh, but it's just a certain segment, and it's illusionary to assume that they are no old, so just conveying knowledge. They are real human beings and selection of human beings. Uh, so it's that in a setting of coercion, more or less, you have to take in that kind of knowledge uh, pre-filtered from a curriculum from people who assume they are no old and no better and know what they have to teach you. So, uh, because those are, those are truths or useful stuff, uh, uh, I think it prepares you to get used to take in nonsense, uh, and that's really the way propaganda really works. It's the indoctrinability. It's not by conveying lies, it's by conveying endless stream of nonsense so that you're not able to distinguish between what's right and wrong, and you come to the kind of relativistic mindset where you always have to ask the experts because you're always unsure uh, about what's going on. Um, and then I think uh, underestimated is the importance of same-age classes because that's, I think, pretty solid evidence from development uh, um, psychology that if you have, if you select children of the same age and you keep them in artificial surrounding of always the same age, you increase all the negative aspects of peer pressure because already by um, evolutionary forces, we are, in a sense, pushed to more look into our peers than into our teacher or authority or parental figures. Uh, so I think the most pernicious effect of schooling is this kind of peer effect, and I think most of what you assume is status propaganda is really pushed on by status games among peer groups where you don't want to stand out. Uh, so that's why it's easier to go along because you know you have to concentrate on other status games. You can't afford to play games on like political fringe ideas or seem fringe and so on and risk unpopularity, uh, which is not worth it in, in that sense. Uh, uh, but uh, you focus mostly on, of course, how you dress, uh, uh, what music you're into, and all that stuff that makes you popular in class. And those are, I think, very well understood ev evolutionary tendencies, but a very artificial surrounding of ha having people together in the same age group. And I think that's the main reason it looks like they're all indoctrinated. They all seem, if you talk to millennials nowadays or, or the generation, a C or how it's called coming out of school, you immediately have the impression, oh my God, they're all brainwashed. They all say the same things, but it's very shallow. It's not that it's really that it, they seem like totally brainwashed, that they've taken it into as a founding belief. It's just they play along because they don't care that much uh, and they had to focus on the status games uh, uh, in school and that prepares them a bit for the status games later, which of course enhance schooling and uh, are one of the main uh, reasons uh, that uh, schooling works. It works as a signal. Uh, it works as a signal uh, and that we know from evolutionary theory as well. I think there is some... Uh, uh, it's, it's reasonable to take a signaling theory uh, signal theory tells you that uh, sometimes you invest a uh, useless cost for something in order to signal that you have high resources. So you just do something really useless. And of course, education used to be signaling before, in particular for the richer and noble 
classes, they went for very useless education, uh, humanistic education and so on, just to express they don't have to. They did sports because they don't have to work. So it's exp that's signaling, uh, I'd say. And the very same is true, of course, with a lot of schooling today that you can afford to have your children uh, until not only age 18, but if they go on in the a more and more school-like university. Uh, if you don't pay attention, they'll turn out 30 and have never seen something else than a classroom uh, before, uh, and, but have high status uh, and have signaled that they don't need to work. I mean, because you are a well-off family and you can afford to protect your children as long as possible from doing anything useful for anyone else. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons it works. That's my, I think there it's much less difference between private schools and public schools than most people believe. My personal experience is there's less freedom of speech now in private schools than in public schools, which seems very odd. But one of the reasons is that government employees sometimes have, of course, much more secure contracts uh, than private employees and still private schools are working in the same industry, which is a very distorted industry, and it's not about education, it's not about knowledge transfer. No one pays above for knowledge transfer per se in schooling, it's about signaling, uh, and of course the highest payment goes for the brand, the highest brands of signaling um, uh, that you can pay for, that you can get. And, uh, Part of that signal is our status games, which I think are inevitable. They're part of human nature, so I wouldn't like to eat. Uh, uh, too much. That's not so much you can change about that. I, I think what's crucial is uh, try not to interfere with better status games, in particular those concerning wealth. I think in a society where the status games based on um, wealth of your parents are not that possible, schooling becomes ever more important and then connections become more important because people always look for something to express their status. So I think that's part of human nature. So it doesn't make sense to look at that. And part of the signaling I think is useful in the sense that it shows higher employability. And the reason for that is if you have a child going for schooling, it's a child that's able to sit from eight to five and later nine to five in a setting where they don't always understand what's the meaning of it all, why is it useful, what is it for, a lot of it seems to be nonsense, but still I learn to function in such an environment and it of course a corporate environment and I think you can only understand why there's still so much private demand for schooling because uh, there is a distorted structure that Saifedean has been talking about uh, before, which he calls the fiat uh, a world more or less that's really uh, a larger structure and in particular Schooling is important if you go for careers in finance and corporate uh, careers uh, and there is really a signal of your employability within those structures which I think are distorted structures and that's why I think we are seeing signs that the correlation which is still there, so there's still an empirical correlation between higher incomes and, and more schooling. So of course it's not Parents are not stupid to go for schooling uh, even though it has all the problems I mentioned so I think it's easy to understand why schooling still has this importance. I think it's usually distorted and I think we're in a phase of correction here because this correlation will go down. I think it's already starting to go down and we see that with the correlation between university degrees and higher incomes which is going down even more faster and I think we'll see that with schooling. Uh, and I think that's also the reason uh, there um, why alternatives uh, empirically don't st or stand out in a very unexpected way. There's a lot of data in the US about the alternatives of homeschooling and unschooling even. So there are more and more families which don't do any schooling. They just basically say, okay, my kid does what he wants and or she wants and if he wants to play all day video games, I'm fine with that. I don't believe in any kind of interference. And of course you would expect, and I would expect as well, that it must show in results if you go for testing, in particular the testing for university admission. And the interesting thing is they are doing better. And it's worrying, so there is no empirical evidence whatsoever that schooling produces higher knowledge or capabilities. So if you really check the results, the success stories, what have you learned after all those years? You figure out, wow, it's receding fast, the curve, and it's reaching zero pretty soon. So you don't have a significant impact of schooling because, of course, the reason for schooling is not knowledge transmission and it has never been uh, I think and, and uh, um, people used it as an illusion to uh, 
Uh, and I think a lot in the philosophy of education is a nice coating for that illusion. The Humboldts and the Fichtes and so on, uh, I think they were wrong, uh, uh, not in everything, but they were wrong in giving a nice sounding coating for something that just doesn't work that way because it's much too idealistic and of course all, they all failed. Uh, I mean there are many uh, enlightened philosophers who tried that out with their old children. They read Emile from Rousseau which has a tremendous impact uh, and Rousseau write more or less about the natural education because everyone is a genius by birth and just bring it out uh, if you employ the right methods and then of course parents tried everything uh, and uh, the most Progressive, enlightened methods usually failed, uh, um, and they failed abysmally. It didn't fail if there was some kind of success story. So Pestalozzi, for example, he failed with his own child, uh, <laughs> a terrible uh, failure. Uh, he failed with his first project. But the main difference why I think Pestalozzi is great uh, and, and uh, the government instituted uh, institutions are not is he did it then as an entrepreneur. So after failing, he had to try a new and only the third institution he created survived and he figured it out in the end and it was considered an example. And I think he got to some uh, good findings which are still in accordance with, with what we know about child development and it's this really child-centered education more or less, much less road learning, much more progression from elementary uh, things uh, going up. Uh, so to uh, sum up, um, I think uh, we are or we have to see that uh, a lot of what we consider the state is basically a kind of theater going on. And uh, we've learned that after 9-11, there was a lot of security theater. We've got used to that. Now we are living in a time of health theater with a lot of seemingly magical things doing their stuff. And I would consider a large part of that the health theater. Uh, and uh, most people don't see for how long that kind of education theater has been going on. And uh, I, I think it's not even, it's more than a theater. I would use the term uh, by David Durer. Uh, I, I think he calls the state an opera. And I think it's even better because it has like the grandiose stage uh, with all these ideas of education and fulfillment of potential and transferring uh, useful knowledge uh, uh, to people by an apparatus doing that and which scales fantastically. Uh, but in the end, it's just keeping our minds occupied. Uh, and it's incredible how much our minds are occupied with that theater. How much of our resources are thinking, either if uh, the time you go for schooling, just remember how much your time was occupied with that education theater. The time you have children, how much about it is about worrying about school or doing schooling at home because they have to do their homework and all that stuff. It's all about school, 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 keeping you occupied. Or of course, if you're working for that apparatus with a larger and larger number of people working for it and they legitimize it because now it's a lot of them are women. And uh, of course, they are working full time so they can't take care of their children. So they need someone to take care of their children so they send them to school. Uh, and of course, the teachers are paid via government. And why does the woman have to work? Uh, I mean, I'm not at all against the women working. Uh, uh, I think it's fantastic to use the potential. But I think there's a, a, some very dark uh, reality as well that in many cases, it's you can't avert ha uh, afford having one parent working and the other not because you're taxed that highly. So to pay the other parent to work, to take care of other children because you can't take care of yourself. So I really invite you to look behind the stage of the big opera that is cooling and hopefully not be too well entertained by what's happening there, but still have a cheerful look uh, to alternatives. Thanks a lot for your attention.